Today's scripture reading is from John 16, 16 through 28. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered into the world, but now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. The word of the Lord. Children are dismissed if you would like to head out to Children's Church. So this morning we are looking at the truly final, final words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. Uh, I told you, I think, I think this is our fifth week that we were going to look at the final words. You had no idea how long I could stretch out final things, did you? We've been looking at chapter 14, 15, 16, and that is the, the time between the communion and the for John, the washing of the disciples' feet, and chapter 17 will be next week, where Jesus prays his final prayer, and then everything happens. He gets arrested, and he's on his way to the cross. And in these last three chapters, Jesus is saying to the disciples the, those last things, right? We said the first time that we looked at this passage a, a month ago, it, it, you had a picture when you're at the deathbed of someone that you love, and you know this is it. This is the final conversation. Suddenly, those words are, are pregnant with meaning, and you hang on to every syllable. And that's what Jesus has given the disciples. And he's told them in these final words about a, a love that knows no end. He, he's, he's told them about a peace that just doesn't fit this life, about the gift of the Spirit who would come and be their comforter. And now, now he tells them about joy about a joy that he says is theirs. It's a joy that takes place even in the face of grief. And, and it is a joy that Christians, you and me, if you're in Jesus Christ, should be marked by at all times, no matter what we face. Now, in my mind, I always hesitate when I think a little bit about uh, talking and preaching and, and saying, hey, well, no matter what you face, no matter the grief that you go through, you should have joy. Because I'm always a little terrified that people get like this picture in their head. Did you watch this movie? Well, right, in, Inside Out, right? Yeah, there we go, there we go. This is, a, it's, if, you, if you have missed this lovely Pixar film, it is a movie about a, a little girl and her parents and, uh, and, and these little, I don't know what they are, creatures, uh, live are, are the emotions that the person has. And this little girl, this is her joy, okay? And joy looks just like this. She is always, all the time, as happy as one can be. Think like the cheerleaders I used to mock. Okay, that's joy. 
And sometimes, and some of us are, are these people, and certainly have hung out in Christian circles, that say, this is what your life should be like. If you're a Christian, you should be jumping up and down for joy all the time. Uh, when I was a little girl, my mom had a song that she used to sing, and I was reminded of, honestly, I was reminded of last weekend, because I was in a public restroom, and someone like three stalls down was singing this. <laughs> and I, I, was, I had to hold in some joy, because I was dying. Uh, but the song that my mom used to sing, was, it's called It's Bubbling. And the song went, um, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. There's singing, and there's laughing, since Jesus made me whole. Folks don't understand it, but I can't keep it quiet. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. Um, there are moments, there are seasons, where the joy, which in a biblical context is not happiness, it's not jumping up and down, joy is just sheer delight in the goodness of God. There are moments in my life when I am so overwhelmed by how good my God is that I look like a cheerleader, right? Like, it's bubbling, and I can't keep it quiet. It, everything within me is just how good God is. But then there are other moments where I am not jumping up and down. There are moments when I'm crying. There are moments when I am angry. There are moments when I am incredibly disappointed or disillusioned or just discouraged. And what Jesus says in this passage is that in those moments... I can still have joy. Because my joy is not contingent on my circumstances. My joy is grounded and it is founded upon the goodness of God. And so what we're going to do today is we're just going to unpack this sentence. I'll just go ahead and tell it to you up front. What I want us to see today is that there is joy in the M-O-U-R-N, mourning. There's joy in the grief. There's joy in the pain. There's joy in the hurt. Because there was joy on that morning. And there will be joy in the morning. For those of us who are in Jesus Christ, those of us who are Christians, my hope is that as we unpack these final, final words of Jesus, that this reminder of joy in the hurt and joy in the sorrow is, is like that anchor that you get to grab hold of. It's the thing that you get to, to latch onto today and be reminded of truths you already know that the goodness of God just overwhelm you today. And that if you're not a Christian, that you hear the beauty that is found only in Jesus Christ and want to have this kind of joy. So let's set the scene here. John 16, right, it is hours before Jesus is about to be betrayed and arrested, and Jesus has been saying this very annoying phrase to the disciples, so much so that they keep repeating it back, right? So 16, verse 16, Jesus says, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you'll see me. <laughs> that first half, a little while, you're not going to see me. The disciples, even, even our disciples here, are smart enough to figure out because Jesus has given us enough clues, right? They hear him say, a little while, and you're not going to see me anymore. And they know. Right? They know what that means. In a little while, you're going to get arrested. In a little while, you're going to be in a tomb. And they hear that word, and friends, um, there's no joy. There's just grief. And then they hear the second half of the statement, but in another little while, you'll see me. And that's just confusing. <laughs> and what does that mean? Uh, you're going to die, and then we'll hang out with your corpse? They're talking to themselves, going, we don't get it, we don't understand it. And Jesus looks at his disciples, and he can see the grief just etched on their faces, the hurt, the discouragement, like the darkness that falls. It's, it's the dark night of the soul, and there's no hope of light or dawning. And Jesus says, okay, here's the last thing you need to know. And so he tells them this. He says, uh, verse, verse 20, I tell you the truth. You will weep, and you will mourn. And in John's gospel, those words, weep and mourn, they show up only at funerals. They show up only talking about Lazarus. They talk about Jesus' funeral. You're going to weep, you're going to mourn. There's going to be grief, there's going to be pain, while the whole world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief, it's going to turn to joy. And we'll revisit this in a second, but I want you to just hear that word. 
right? He looks at the disciples and he says flat out, no question about it, you will grieve, it is going to hurt, the next thing that comes your way is not going to be pleasant. In case there was ever a doubt that you following Jesus would mean there will be no hurting or mourning or pain or tears in your life. He says, it's going to happen. But your grief is going to turn. It's going to metamorphosize. It's going to transform into joy. Now, he does not say your grief will be utterly replaced by joy and you'll never experience it. He says it's going to change. In the morning, there will be joy. And here's why. Jump ahead two verses to verse uh, 22. He says, so with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice. And no one, no one and nothing will take that joy away from you. And I think Jesus is saying something pretty amazing here that we got to look at. Right? He looks at them and he says, you're grieving right now. You will grieve. This life, this time is going to hurt. And in the disciples' context, he's speaking literally the next three days. Everything that you're about to see is going to cause you untold grief. But I'm going to see you again. Are you going to catch that? See, Jesus had originally said to the disciples, in a little while you won't see me, but in another little while you will see me. It gets repeated three times. And I don't think that John repeats it three times because he thought, oh, this is fun, I know how to write these words. Right? He repeats it three times so we pay attention. But when Jesus gets here, he changes the phrase. He does not say, in a little while you'll see me. He says, in a little while after your grief, I will see you. And when I see you, when I come to you, then you're going to rejoice with the kind of joy that nothing and nobody can ever take away. Now, I think that there's a double layer to what Jesus is saying, but let's just think about it first from the perspective of the disciples. They really did walk through an insane amount of grief. They watched Jesus be arrested, betrayed. They denied him. They did the betrayal. They watched him be brutalized and murdered, and all their hopes hang on a cross, and then all of a sudden, they're behind a tomb. There is grief and pain and mourning like they couldn't believe. And on that third day, very early in the morning, as Luke puts it, the women show up, and they get to a tomb, and what do they find? It's not a trick question. They find nothing, right? The stone's been rolled away. There's nobody in that tomb. And most of the women, we were told, they run back to the disciples to say, somebody stole his body. But Mary Magdalene, if you remember, in Luke's Gospel, she stays. She stays weeping, mourning, her heart broken, because now not only is Jesus dead, but someone desecrated the grave. She can't even honor his body. And Jesus shows up. And Mary's all kinds of confused. She thinks he's the gardener. She thinks maybe he stole the body. And Jesus just says, Mary. And all of a sudden, her eyes open. And this woman who was beside the tomb, weeping for fear that she was forever going to be alone, now knows she's not. Because Jesus came and saw her. And the joy that flooded her soul because all of a sudden Mary looks and says, he's alive. I thought he was gone. I thought I'd never see him again. I thought I'd never hear his voice again. And he's here. So when Jesus came to see Mary, friends, she had a reason to rejoice in her mourning. Because on that morning, the first resurrection morning, she came to know she'd never be alone. You keep going in that day, right? How about when Jesus comes to Peter? Peter, who thought for certain Jesus would never, ever, ever want to see him again (laughs) because Peter denied him to his face, right? Peter told the little girl who asked him, weren't you with Jesus? And he curses and says, I didn't even know that guy. And Jesus knew it. And then we'll read it here in a few weeks, the end of the Gospel of John. Jesus comes to Peter, to Peter, and he sees him. And he looks at him, and he says, hey, Peter, do you still love me? Because I still love you. And then he sends Peter out to do the work he called Peter to do before Peter royally messed up. And there was joy. 
It's the kind of joy that let Peter know, I have a God who not only is resurrected, but he's a God who forgives. He's a God who's still going to use the likes of me. You know, nothing and nobody could take that away. On that very first Easter morning, when Jesus rose from the dead, he brought joy that can never be removed. And if you've encountered Jesus Christ, if you know him, then you know what it is to be seen by the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know what it is to be seen by the one who looks at you and says, you're mine and I love you. And there is no circumstance, there is no situation that can ever diminish that joy. My first congregation, I had a, a woman, by the time I knew her, she was in her late 70s, early 80s, um, and uh, she'd been through an awful lot. And when I first met her, like literal first day, uh, I said, hi, I'm Pastor Kelly, who are you? And she said, I'm Bridget Bordeaux. Okay, that's a generation thing, okay? Some of you just laughed, and I went, nice to meet you, Bridget. <laughs> so glad to see you. Everyone younger at my age, you can Google that one later. She was lying, okay? Her name was Laura. Laura had been through a lot. Uh, widowed at a very early age, uh, Laura had suffered her entire life from what would, should have been diagnosed as clinical depression, um, major anxiety. By the time I knew her, barely left her house because she was too terrified, wouldn't drive anymore, um, COPD. Like, she'd been through the ringer. And when Laura would hit the really low parts in depression, she wouldn't leave at all. And her daughter would call me and say, will you go see mom? And I would go over to Laura's house, and, uh, and she would cry. And she would say, Pastor, I hate myself. And I'd let her get it out of her system. And then through her tears, she would look and say, but Jesus loves me. That's joy. Joy was being able to sit there and say, I still delight in the goodness of God. Because there is a Savior who loves me. You and I live on this side of that first morning. We live on this side of knowing that we have a Savior who has overcome the grave, who has overcome sin, who has overcome death, who has overcome hell, and he did it for you. Which means that any circumstance you face, you sit in the middle of and you say, this hurts. And my Savior still lives. This hurts. And my Savior's still on his throne. This hurts. And my Savior's still praying for me. There's joy, friends, in the morning. But I think this statement that Jesus makes is both specifically for the disciples. Now is the time of your grief, but I'm going to see you again in three days. But I think it's also for us. Because now is the time for our grief. You and I live on this side of that first morning. So we know all the promises. We have seen the first taste of resurrected life in Jesus Christ. But we live here. And life still hurts. And there are parts of our worlds for every one of us that are not okay. There are things that we see in the world around us that is not the way it's supposed to be. And if joy is defined as jumping up and down and saying, yay, we don't have tons of reasons. But if joy is delight in the goodness of God, then even though now is our time of grief, we have a reason to still have joy. Because Jesus finishes the statement, right? Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again. And then you will rejoice with a rejoicing that nobody can take away. See, there's joy in the morning because there was joy on that morning when Jesus resurrected. But there's also joy in our grief and our hurt because one day there will be a morning that never ends. John, who authored the Gospel of John, wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, also wrote the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, he's given a picture, a vision of what will happen one day when Jesus, the one who is resurrected, returns. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, he says that on that day, there will be no more night. None. They won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. 
in the Gospel of John, in the book of Revelation, and in the Bible, night is symbolic. Night characterizes a chaos and evil and pain. And so when John in the book of Revelation says, there's going to come a day where morning will dawn and never cease. He says, there will be a day when there will no longer be anything wrong in this world because Jesus is going to come back and make it right. In the chapter prior to that, in chapter 21, he says this is what that day with no night will be like. He says on that day, God will come and live with us. We'll be his people, and God himself will be with us, and he'll be our God. He'll wipe every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things has passed away. You and I live between the two mornings. We live between the morning when Christ was resurrected and he has promised and guaranteed that our forgiveness is won, that he has won every battle, and between the day when it will be morning that never ends. And in between, we're invited to joy. You know, Laura, Bridget Bordeaux, one day, some of you have heard me tell this story, and I, I, it's one of those stories I'm going to tell when I'm 90 because it was just that real. Her daughter called me and said, come to the ER, come now. Mom's going to die. So I drove over to the ER, and I get there, and Laura's daughter, who was in her 60s at that point, is crying, and she says, Pastor, tell her she can't die. Tell her she can't die. I'm just like, sweetheart, I'm so, I appreciate the authority you give me can't do this one. <laughs> her daughter is, is sobbing at the thought of losing her mother. And Laura, severe COPD, barely speak, couldn't lift herself off the gurney, grabs my hand, looks me in the eye, and says, no. Pastor, you tell her. And then she starts to sing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. If you know the last verse of the song, and we sang the whole thing, you know the last verse says, and then one day I'll cross this river and that, that life's final war will be won. And I will see the lights of glory and I will know that life's worth the living, right? Because he lives. And a couple hours later, my friend went home to Jesus. She laid on a gurney, unable to breathe, with joy. See, there's joy in the morning because we know that Jesus Christ has kept every promise that was ever made. He did it when he died and he rose again. And one day he's coming back. One day every wrong will be made right. One day failing bodies will function. We live in between in the M-O-U-R-N, morning. But in that morning, there's joy. Because we still get to delight in the goodness of God, holding on to those two anchors. But we know what's true. Jesus goes on, and he tells the disciples a couple of truths you and I need to hear. One, he lays out an analogy for him. He says there is, in fact, joy in the morning. There's joy in the brokenness. There's joy in the grief. But it is not a joy that means you will never feel pain. Right? Verse 21, he says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So it is with you. Right now is the time of your grief, but you will receive rejoicing. Jesus gives us a beautiful image there. It's a beautiful image that's mean to make us think. Now, I have not had the privilege of child pain, childbirth pains, but I'm told they're not fun. Now, ladies, you can confirm or deny this one for me. Uh, Jesus says that when a woman is in the middle of giving birth, she cries out in incredible pain, but when they hand the baby to her and put the baby on her chest, he says, it's like that pain, just, it diminishes, right? It is replaced. There's this, it transforms into joy 
at having a baby. Is that part, yeah, yeah, we agree? Okay, ladies, quick question. When you hold the baby, do you immediately, completely, totally, for the rest of your life, forget the pain of birthing said child? Yeah, I'm gonna go with no. My mom likes to remind me on my birthday how bad it was. <laughs> uh, next thing, uh, when they hold the baby and they hand the baby to you, excuse me, does the pain stop? I'm gonna go with no. Most of you still have pushing to do. There's a placenta to come. There's incisions maybe on the other side or sutures. You're going to recover for weeks, and your body, as my mother reminds me, will never be the same. And that's the image Jesus picks. Please don't ever let someone tell you that for you as a believer in Jesus Christ, to experience joy means, one, you forget. Like, oh, gee, I just totally forgot I felt pain in this lifetime. Please don't ever let someone tell you that joy means that it, joy and sorrow cannot coexist. That joy and pain don't happen at the same time. That joy and suffering, that joy and mourning don't go together. They do. And the pain of this life, it changes you for this life. And the joy that is yours because Jesus has died and resurrected and will one day return is still yours. So how do you get it? It strikes me that Jesus tells the disciples about joy, and then all of a sudden we're talking about prayer. And it's, it seems like, oh, we just changed gears. I don't think we did. I think Jesus is simply about to tell us how you tap into this joy. See, because Christ rose and Christ will return, if you're a Christian, the joy is yours. You can have it. It's there. But I've got to receive it. And so Jesus says, there's a couple of really simple things we can do. You want to know joy in the middle of your mourning? Pray in Jesus' name. Verse 23, Jesus says, In that day, right, that day when you receive joy that no one can take away, in that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you haven't asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now for the disciples, they literally had never prayed in Jesus' name. An era was about to begin. When Jesus is, dies and is resurrected, this era of us praying in his name starts. And the thing about praying in Jesus' name, friend, is that it, it actually is not magic words. Right? To pray in Jesus' name does not just mean, Lord, give me a Ferrari in Jesus' name. Pray in Jesus' name is, is a heart posture. Say the words or don't. Because to pray in Jesus' name means you pray based on Jesus' merit instead of your own. The truth is, I pray in Kelly's name all the time. Now, don't get me wrong. I never finish a prayer going, Lord, do the following thing in Kelly's name, so let it be. But I pray based on Kelly's merit, especially in the grief, especially in the mourning. Because when life's hurting, I do one of two things, and they're both in my name. Either I say, I don't deserve for things to be different. So I don't pray about it. I don't ask for God to show up. I don't ask him to do anything, because based on Kelly's merit, I don't deserve it. Or I come before God, and I am ticked off, and I have demands. And in Kelly's name, based off what I think I deserve, and yes, my intelligence, which is clearly more than his, he needs to do the following thing on my timeline and in my way. Pray in your name ever? I think there's a reason why Jesus talking to disciples who are about to walk through incredible grief that he says, start praying in my name. You see, the joy that you and I have is that in those times of incredible hurt and grief, you get to rest in the absolute assurance that your prayers are received before the throne of God and it's got nothing to do with you. It's on Jesus' merit. So if you fall into the camp that says, I don't pray about this stuff because I just don't think I deserve it. Why would, my personal favorite, no, I haven't prayed about that. There's so many more important things in the world. Just how special do you think you are? Come pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Because you come before God based on his merit, not yours. But you also have to come 
recognizing that you come on his merit. You and I don't deserve anything on our own. What we receive is gift freely given because of Jesus. And the one in whose name we pray is the creator of everything. It means he knows what you and I don't know. It means he's a little bit smarter than we are. You want to know joy? Pray based on his merit. Pray trusting his will. But also pray in the Father's love. Verse 26, Jesus says, In that day, you're going to ask in my name. Now, I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. You read what he says? He says, you're going to pray in my name, you're going to pray based on my Mary. He says, but I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to get a picture that like what happens in heaven is Kelly prays in her grief and mourning and asks God to do something and then Jesus goes to God and says, okay, listen, let's make a deal. Uh, how can I convince you to like Kelly? He says, it's not what happens. He says, it's not that I go to the Father and, and I have to kind of wheel and deal and convince God to do something on your behalf. No, he says in verse 27, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and you have believed that I came from God. And sometimes in the middle of the hurt, when we're in the middle of mourning, we start to get this feeling in the back of our minds that maybe just maybe God doesn't love us, that maybe we need Jesus to convince him to like us. And we forget that the Father that we come before, who gave his Son, who will one day send his Son in return to make everything right, is the same Father who loves you and me. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are as loved today as you will be in glory. You are that loved. Which means you can pray trusting that the one you're praying to and the one who is answering those prayers loves you. We don't have time to unpack all of that, but you've, you've heard me say it before, and so I'll just say it here again. The Father always answers the prayer that you and I would have prayed if we knew what he knew. Always. He is a God who loves you more than you can believe. And sometimes, just like with little kids, you know, with young kids, mommies and daddies come in and they say, I know what's best, and when they do what is best for the kid, the kid cries and screams and says, you hate me. But mommy and daddy is just doing what they know that child doesn't understand is actually best. When you pray, pray knowing that your father loves you. That's how you tap into joy in the morning. And here's the last thing. I think you can rest in Jesus' joy while you're in the middle of that morning too. In the analogy that Jesus used about uh, the woman giving birth our English translations say a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But the Greek is really fascinating. The Greek actually says because her hour has come. And in John's gospel, hour refers to when Jesus is, dies, is resurrected, and ascended. Like it has a very specific meaning. It references his death. Now in John's culture 2,000 years ago, when a woman was giving birth, it was even more risky and more painful than it is now, right? This is pre-epidural. It's also pre-hospital and NICU and everything else. When that woman went to give birth, she was laying her life on the line, and there is an incredible chance she'd be sacrificing her life for a child to live. So she cries out in pain. She knew what was coming. In his hour, when Jesus went to the cross, he also cried out in pain. And he did not cry out in pain in the idea that he might need to sacrifice his life for you and I to be born again in him. He cried out knowing he was in fact going to give his life. And when he did, the author of the book of Hebrews puts it this way. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, he says, It is because of the joy awaiting him that Jesus Christ endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Part of the joy that was awaiting Jesus Christ on the other side of the cross is you and me. When you come praying in the middle of your hurt, when you come praying in Jesus' name and the Father's love, you can rest in Jesus' joy. He knows the pain. He's felt every last bit of it. 
And he went all the way to his death for the joy of knowing us today and for all of eternity. That's the God you get to rest in. The band's coming forward. We're going to go before this God in prayer. And for some of us, we are very much in the morning, in the hurt of this life. I invite you to come before him and pray. And if you need to come today in Jesus' name, his merit, not yours, then come and pray that way. If you need to come today and, and pray in the Father's love, then confess that that love is yours. And if today you just need to rest in his joy, come before the God who says you can have joy in the morning because there was joy on that morning and there will be on the morning that never ends. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for a joy that nothing and nobody can ever take away. A joy that's not circumstantial, a joy that is grounded on who you are. I pray for myself, Lord. I pray for my brothers and sisters that increasingly we would, or we would choose to receive that joy. That in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the suffering, in the middle of the hurt, Lord, we would allow those places of grief to drive us to you. That as we pray, Jesus, and we get to rely on your truth and your goodness and your love, the fact that the Father delights in us even when it hurts. Lord, may we increasingly be a people who find that we know in the depths of our soul the goodness of God. Jesus, thanks for loving us. We pray these things in your name. And all God's people said,